Тъй като следващата презентация е на английски, ще направим представянето на английски. Thank you very much for coming. Please take your places. And today we have two speakers here because they will be talking about something amazing. Not only amazing because it's Linux, because it's a real-time Linux. Both engineers, very experienced from SUSE, and they'll be talking about real-time Linux for real. <laughs> Rado Kolev and, um, Bogdan. Bogdan. and Bogdan. <laughs> Please, a Thank round you. of applause for them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for the patience. And uh, first, let me say that I'm very happy to be here at the 20th anniversary of uh, OpenFest. And a big thank you for the, all the people, all the volunteers and organizers who kept this great event running for 20 long years. Uh, and I'm happy we won't disappoint you to be part of it. I'm Radoslav Kolev. I work with Linux one way or the other for a bit more than 20 years. I've been system administrator, software developer, quality assurance engineer. Uh, last 10 years, I was making software for embedded devices. And uh, since a couple of years, I joined SUSE. And uh, together with Bogdan, we are on the so-called automotive team. And we are adapting the SUSE operating system to work on cars. And uh, I'll let Bogdan say a few words about him. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Bogdan Lizepelkov. Together with Rado, we are in automotive team at SUSE. But I came from a bit different background from the world of automotive and real-time operating systems. Just uh, a very few words. Who has heard about SUSE from the audience? Oh, wow, I don't need to say anything. Uh, it's an open source company, the company behind the OpenSUSE community operating system and SUSE Enterprise Linux. Uh, if you are interested to know more, there is a stand outside. You can get some uh, nice OpenSUSE and SUSE gear if you answer some questions or collect some barcodes. There is some game, so I encourage you to, to visit it. And also, SUSE has now an office in Bulgaria, soon, officially. And if you want to see what opportunities they have for you and work on open source projects, you can go at the stand and speak with the nice people there. Uh, and now I want to start by asking you one more question. And it's a little bit a controversial thing. Like people have very strong uh, beliefs which side you should peel the banana uh, or which is the best text editor. So this is kind of such a question. And the question is, what is the correct way to stay when going on the escalator? And there is one option, A, which is that everybody stays on both sides. And there is, ah, well, my slide is broken for some reason. <laughs> uh, so one option, A, is that there should not be people on the left side, only one or two of them. And option B, there is people everywhere. Uh, so please, if you always stay on the right and leave the left lane free, raise your hand. OK, the majority of people. And if you believe the people should be staying on both sides, raise your hand. The anarchists in the room. Uh, sorry for the next technical glitch uh, we had, but I have no idea how this uh, happened, actually. Uh, the answer like many things in life and in software, is that the correct answer is it depends. Uh, and it depends if we want to optimize the system for throughput or for low latency. Uh, unfortunately, like many things in life, we have to choose only one. You cannot optimize for both. In case we optimize for throughput in the LX, X, in the uh, elevator example, it's the number of people per second that are being transported. It's more efficient if both steps are used all the time. Uh, but on the other side, if we are standing on the right and we are not in a big hurry, we allow for somebody who has an emergency to run past us on the left lane. Uh, and we lose throughput almost in half 
but we have this uh, possibility that uh, if uh, I want to go to the hospital right away, I can run past you and go. This is a fact of, uh, of life. It's, uh, it's one or the other. Uh, in computer terms, it is quite the same. We have to choose between throughput and latency. And throughput, we define uh, as the tasks performed by a computer over a certain period of time. And it's usually what we optimize uh, for. Imagine we have a bunch of web servers. Uh, what is our goal? We want to serve as many requests per second as we can. And we want to keep those CPU cores busy, ideally 100% uh, utilization all of the time. Uh, we are not really concerned if there is five people making requests at our web server at the same time, who gets his request answered first, or if one is delayed by a fraction of a second. So uh, normally operating systems like Linux are optimized for high throughput. And overall, the operating system, the hardware, everything, uh, the usual scenario, it's we care only about high throughput and high utilization for the expensive hardware uh, that we paid for. Uh, on the contrary, the latency, it is the delay between cause and effect, the, the reaction time of our system, uh, how long it will take when there is some external uh, stimulus to our system for it to be able to at least start reacting to it. The reaction itself, maybe if it is, uh, contains some complex computation, uh, we don't account for it now, but it's the time between an external event and the system switches to the software side where it starts processing uh, this event. Uh, and this is uh, special for real-time systems. We care much more about low latency and consistent latency, not even about uh, lowest possible latency, but about consistent latency than about throughput. And we sacrifice uh, some throughput in order to gain this uh, latency. Uh, so many people, when they hear the term real time, they ask, so will it make my system faster if I turn this option? And the answer is sadly no. It will actually make it slower if we consider uh, by throughput. By a bit, not too much. Uh, but why this is so? Well, context switching takes time. When you tell the CPU to switch from one task to the other more urgent one, uh, this is not a free operation. All register needs to be saved on the stack. Uh, most probably, the caches in the CPU will not be of much use when you switch to the new process. So all this uh, slows the overall throughput down, but you gain uh, the low latency. And also, real-time systems uh, are not always obsessed with uh, full resource utilization. A little bit similar. I know we are in Bulgaria, and this, uh, this uh, analogy may not be <laughs> making sense to everyone, but uh, in the highway, we have a third lane, the emergency lane. So when there is a traffic jam, uh, the ambulance can speed by. So this is a low latency situation, and we are sacrificing uh, one third of throughput capacity possible, theoretically, of the highway, just to have this possibility. Uh, and it's the same here. Sometimes we will uh, dedicate a CPU core for a single real-time task that we want to handle with low latency, and there will be uh, probably most of the time this core will be uh, idling and not busy at all. But we sacrifice this for that when the high, uh, the, the high important work comes, we react very fast. We don't have to switch uh, from another uh, context. And most importantly, it puts an upper bound. That's what we care, actually. We care about the worst case, how long it will take for our system to react to an external uh, stimulus. And ideally, we want this uh, range of reaction times to be much narrower than uh, in a non-real-time system. Uh, I have here uh, two graphs. Uh, first, just a formal definition. According to Wikipedia, a real-time system is said to be a system where the correctness of an operation depends not only on its logical correctness, but upon the time in which it is performed. 
Uh, that means that not only our software needs to do the correct operations, but needs to do it in time before a certain deadline. Uh, usually, we are not concerned with that. We are completely happy if our software is correct, which is rare enough. Uh, I've quite seen software with no bugs, but here we are uh, much more picky. Even if the software is working fine, if it doesn't complete on time, uh, we say it is not, uh, not good for our situation. Uh, just to give you an example of, of a real uh, scenario that we have met, uh, for example, we have had a complaint that there is a certain software process which receives networking packets from somewhere externally. And these packets come regularly, let's say, every five milliseconds. And there are no lost packets, all the data arrives, but at certain points in time, instead of the packets arriving every five milliseconds, there is a 20 millisecond delay, and then three packets arrive uh, all at the same time. This is not acceptable uh, for a real-time operating system. Uh, but for a web server or something like that, nobody would care. Uh, and here, it, it is a little bit uh, the end goal of our uh, Linux real-time talk. Uh, these two graphs represent the before and after, and we'll fill the content by explaining uh, how, how we got there. On the left, you can see a normal Linux kernel, and the reaction times uh, are pretty good when you look at it. They are close to zero. I mean, this peak is almost near the left axis. Uh, but unfortunately, if, if you look more closely, the span, the worst case, according to the graph, it's more than 1,700 microseconds. And there is a few blips at 200, 250, uh, 370. Uh, and the, the worst is that we don't know actually how slow it can get. Uh, for example, your system is overloaded, especially if it starts swapping or something like that, you can get basically unlimited uh, reaction time. On the other hand, after applying the preempt RT uh, patch set, which we'll talk a bit after, we can see that the figure is uh, much more uh, applicable to real time. We have a bounded latency of around, let's call it 25 microseconds, and the spread is much, much narrower, or the so-called jitter, the variation of this rea reaction time is quite uh, small. So this is what uh, we are aiming for, and the question is, uh, how do we get there? Uh, just a little bit of an aside, we are talking about real-time systems, and we will use this term a lot during the lecture. Uh, there is a distinction between two types of real-time systems, hard real-time systems and soft real-time systems. The difference is that what happens if our system fails to meet the deadline? In case of hard real-time system, it's very bad. It's considered a total system failure if we miss the deadline. Examples of such system are the computers in your car controlling the engine, the software controlling your pacemaker, or an industrial uh, robot. And examples of such systems are, for example, small microcontrollers running no operating system at all. They are for sure real time because there is no other processes uh, to meddle with our single CPU core usually. But there is also QNX, Autosar, FreeRTOS, Zephyr, and many other. Uh, we, when we use the term real-time systems in the context of this presentation, we imply it's a multitasking system, so there is many processes uh, eligible to run, and also very often there is more than one CPU available to run uh, these processes. Uh, and in case of Linux, it's not there yet for the hard real-time system. I wouldn't trust my life on Linux alone. It is more the case of a soft real-time system where missing a deadline is not pleasant, but nobody is going to die. Example of such system is audio and video conversations or streaming. Every one of us has experienced glitches watching uh, their streaming video or talking with somebody on the phone. But it's not a big disaster. We can ask the person to repeat what he said. Uh, and examples of such system are real-time Linux, that is a topic of this talk, Windows 10, IoT, uh, and others. So, have in mind that Linux 
he has real-time capabilities, but in order uh, to meet the fail-safe guarantees, usually you would need an external system to monitor it and uh, provide a safe reaction in case it doesn't meet uh, the deadline. And to understand how we can get Linux from high latency, unpredictable system, as was on the left graph on the previous slide, to a bound latency, low jitter, high, re high responsive reaction time system, uh, we need to first understand some basic concepts about how multitasking operating systems and Linux in particular work, and then we'll see how the preempt RT patch set changes some of these operations to make it much more friendly for the RT case. So I'll give uh, the symbolic token to Bogdan, who can do us a very quick intro into the Linux OS concepts. Yeah, thank you. Before we jump to preempt RC, we should uh, go briefly over some classic uh, concepts of operating system. Uh, there is a standard separation between kernel and the user space. Uh, it is not only for Linux, but it is also uh, uh, true for other operating systems. You can think of user space as a kind of isolation of user processes from the core functionality, functionality of the operating system itself. When your code is executed in kernel mode, uh, the CPU uh, is in some special state called privilege mode, where you can access any memory everywhere, including kernel and user space. Uh, but when you're operating in user space, you can refer to the memory blocks which are allocated specifically for your process. Yeah, interrupts. Also very important thing, uh, just to simplify, you can think of interrupts. Uh, it's like uh, signals that are sent by hardware to CPU when the hardware needs the CPU attention, when it needs some CPU time. Uh, interrupt handlers are usually implemented in two major parts, so-called top half and bottom half. Top half is a piece of code where it, which is really very, very small, as small as possible, and it is executed right away when the interrupt comes. And the rest of the stuff is executed in bottom half in any time when the scheduler of operating system believes it's handy to do. Concept of preemption. The preemption. One of the most important things for a real-time operating system. There is no way to build real-time operating system without preemption. Preemption is a property of operating system that allows it uh, to interrupt a task right in the middle of the execution and reassign another task. Because obviously you want uh, your real-time task to be executed uh, before the deadline comes. Uh, just Bogdan, I will mention here, so this is uh, most popular and the model that Linux uses for the scheduling of uh, not just real time, but the scheduler can preempt, meaning it can switch out the current process if an event with higher priority arrives. Uh, and the, just for completeness, the other model is so-called cooperative uh, multitasking instead of preemptive, where we would wait for the current process running to voluntarily give up uh, the core so another process can be scheduled. And obviously this would not work well for a real-time system because in real-time system we want at the exact moment when a higher priority process needs to be run to get rid of the currently running one and start the higher priority one. Preemption models. Uh, let's consider two traditional preemption models that were available before uh, preempt RT patch set. First of all, preempt none and uh, preempt voluntary. Preempt none is uh, 
I think, absolutely disaster for RT applications. Because RT code, sorry, kernel code is not interruptible at all. Uh, but there are some special places in the kernel where uh, the scheduler is invoked. Those are system calls and interrupts. Voluntary is a bit better uh, from RT point of view. There were added some special explicit preemption points in the kernel code where the kernel can be interrupted, but still uh, none of them are RT friendly. Yeah, kernel logs. Uh, Logs is the, I think, uh, yeah, one of the major synchronization primitives that are used uh, by developers to synchronize uh, access to the shared resources. There are two major kinds of uh, logs, spinning logs and sleeping logs. Uh, just looking ahead, spinning logs are absolutely not RT friendly because when we, are, when we are holding the spinning logs, preemption is disabled. Uh, spinning logs behave in a way that when uh, your code achieves the log and the log is uh, not freed, the code will be uh, spinning in the same place over and over again, trying to check if, if the log is freed. And when it's freed, it, uh, it will reach the uh, the, the shared resource. Well, sleeping log, when it reaches the shared resource, which is locked, it will call automatically the schedule that will uh, reassign the task if there are yeah, more, uh, more, 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 more important task more uh, uh, to, to execute. I can make a very uh, basic analogy, which would be, I think, familiar to anybody who has a small child or has traveled with one in a car. Basically, a spinning walk is equivalent to the child asking all the way, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's what the CPU is doing with the spinning clock. It is checking all the time, is this lock free? Is the in a, let's say in one loop and the only break out of the loop if the resource that this lock holds is freed. Uh, but the problem is that during all this time, this CPU core is taken and no other process can be scheduled on it. So if a lower priority process takes a spinning lock, it cannot get uh, preempted in the normal Linux kernel, uh, even if a higher priority external event comes. And this will cause a big delay in the processing of the important event uh, we care about. And the sleeping wonk on the other side would be equivalent to the baby saying, okay, I'm going to sleep, please wake me up when we arrive. So you have very calm uh, journey in the car. And in this case, the sleeping uh, process, immediately when it sees the resource is not available right now, it frees the CPU and the scheduler is free to schedule another process. So there is no big delay until the resource is freed. Uh, what we discussed so far, Bogdan's uh, OS concepts explanation, is the standard Linux kernel. Uh, and as we see, it is at, not at all uh, suitable for a real-time system. Uh, some people really wanted to try to make Linux real-time. Uh, and we have to ask the question, but why? Why would we want to make Linux real-time when Linux was never designed in the first place as a real-time system. So it's very complicated to retrofit a, a general purpose OS and make it real-time. Uh, and there are good enough reasons. The biggest reason is that Linux is a very popular operating system with very good network stack uh, with Unix-like uh, structure, which a lot of people are familiar with, and it would be great instead of using an obscure, specialized, real-time operating system, we could just somehow make Linux uh, able to handle real-time uh, tasks. By the way, just to mention that uh, this is, although it sounded crazy at the time when the first attempts were made, uh, this is not such a rare, uh, rare development of things for Linux. Linux was 
Do you know how many architectures Linux supports now? But just a ballpark. Let's say 10, I don't even know, but I can name uh, x86, uh, ARM, MIPS, uh, RISC V, uh, IBM, big mainframe machines, Alpha. Uh, Linux was never designed to support these architectures. In fact, Linux was specifically only designed to work on Intel uh, 386 computer that Linux Torvalds had. So it is kind of a, a backwards way with this again, Linux was never designed to be a real-time operating system, but some people had the need, so they decided to work on it. And it, we can see it succeeded with supporting many, many computer architectures, and we hope it will succeed in becoming a real-time. Uh, unfortunately, this was a very huge uh, undertaking, and you can see on this graph that uh, the patch set, so this meaning the changes to the original Linux kernel to make it real-time capable uh, are very, very big. And uh, to make matters even worse, the Linux kernel is a very fast-moving target. Uh, and to keep these patches applying cleanly to every new release is a huge amount of work. That's why the maintainers behind this project didn't even attempt to keep it compatible with every new Linux version uh, coming out, but they only take uh, more long-term supported ones. Uh, and just for those, they adapt uh, the patches to it. Uh, the good news is that little by little, with the years, parts of the preempt RT patch set have been making their way into the upstream uh, Linux kernel. Uh, there is this running joke, <laughs> it was, I don't know, 20 years ago, if you've heard about the, who has heard about the year of the Linux desktop? That next year, it will be the year of the Linux desktop. Well, I don't know if we are at the Linux desktop yet, and there is this same joke about the preempt RT patch set. For 10 years now, in every conference or Linux weekly news article, somebody says, this year, the patch will be merged into the <laughs> official Linux kernel, and we are not there yet. Uh, but we are almost there. I would say 90% of the patch has made it into the mainline Linux. And there is actually one big hurdle uh, remaining. And surprisingly, it is not some complicated locking mechanism or the scheduler or something like that. Uh, the big hurdle remaining to be handled is the print K system in the kernel. This is the like printf equivalent that brings the messages on your screen but it has turned surprisingly that it's very hard to make this uh, system real-time friendly. Uh, but there are smart people working on it. Hopefully, if this uh, gets resolved, the Linux kernel will not need these patches applied anymore to be real-time capable. It will come uh, built in. Uh, and what does actually preempt RT bring to the Linux kernel. Uh, actually, this option, I think it's now already in the vanilla kernel, but it brings a new, uh, a new scheduler, a new option which is called fully preemptable kernel. Uh, the big problem uh, is that before the kernel called itself was kind of like a treating user space or our application code as a second class citizens. Uh, the application code could always be preempted by the scheduler. The scheduler could always switch one process for the other. But the kernel code itself was not preemptable. And if the kernel is doing something, uh, in a lot of cases, the application code waits until the kernel finishes his job, and then it can get scheduled. And this is what caused the big delays uh, in the non-real-time capable Linux. And this config option uh, makes not 100%, but almost all parts of the kernel preemptable, meaning that even if the system is running currently code inside the kernel, if a high priority user space process needs to run, this code will be preempted, and on this CPU will be scheduled the high priority user space uh, code. How this is achieved? The two big things are that all the spinning locks which uh, uh, hoard a CPU core are converted to sleeping locks. 
This means that all these locks no longer take full control of the CPU core and can be immediately switched for more important uh, tasks. And the second part is that almost all interrupt handlers are converted to so-called threaded interrupt handlers. Uh, because in the normal Linux kernel, interrupt code is not preemptible. If you are inside an interrupt handler, you cannot uh, remove it from the currently running CPU and put another process. And this change instead splits every interrupt into a very small part which just starts a new kernel thread and all the interrupt work is done inside this kernel thread. And this kernel thread can be uh, preempted. So there are still very, very few critical sections in the kernel which are not preemptable, but they are highly optimized to take very small amount of time. So we don't, uh, we don't suffer big uh, delays because of it. Uh, and it introduced a lot of new configuration options to make our system behave the way it should. And Bogdan will give us some more details about them. Yeah, just a few details uh, that should be kept in mind when you're developing RT application. Because when you apply the preempt RT parse, it doesn't mean that uh, your application magically becomes uh, real-time friendly or real-time. Uh, first thing is the CPU affinity and CPU isolation. Uh, there is a possibility in Linux to pin your process to a certain core or certain cores. Uh, that will uh, reduce latencies because there will be no migration from one core to another. And uh, obviously, you, uh, yeah, this is your choice when you're developing the RT application. But there is another thing that uh, while, your while your process is pinned, of course, another process can migrate to the same CPU and uh, concurrent with uh, your process for the CPU time. And for this, you can use the CPU isolation. You can dedicate core or several cores for your process and uh, nothing else will be running there. Uh, RQ Affinity, very similar thing. You can do uh, the same trick for uh, interrupt handlers. You can pin interrupt handlers to the CPU or allocate some CPU cores for uh, interrupt handlers that are important for you. It is very important to keep in mind uh, because there are Sorry, Radu, can you go back? Yes. <laughs> yeah, a few more, few more words. Uh, it is very important to keep in mind that uh, there are very resource-consuming uh, interrupts, for example, network interrupts. And uh, certainly you don't want such an interrupt to be, uh, to be uh, handled at the same CPU together with uh, your running application. So keep in mind and plan where, uh, where those things should be running. Scheduling classes. Uh, there are two kinds of scheduling classes, non-RT and RT ones. Uh, the biggest difference between them is that when you uh, set uh, RT scheduling class to your process, you also have to define the priority. The greater priority, the better. And uh, as long as uh, all uh, tasks have uh, different priorities, the, art, the scheduling class uh, doesn't matter. It comes into play when there are two or more uh, tasks with the same priority, and then scheduler will be defined based on the defined uh, scheduling class. Uh, so we patched our kernel with the preempt RT patched chosen the preempt RT option, did all the configs that Bogdan advised us, we pinned the process to a certain CPU core, we set the real-time priority, etc. But unfortunately, this is still not enough 
for our code to have real time uh, low latency response. Uh, if you are writing kernel code, this is just a remark, what you should avoid? You should avoid using a raw spin lock. A raw spin lock is a lock type which even under the real time patch is spinning because unfortunately there are very few places where we cannot get away with exchanging a, a spinning lock for a sleeping lock. But you should use this only where it's really needed. And should avoid forcing non-threaded interrupt because again, non-threaded interrupt cannot be preempted and is hogging the CPU core until it lets it go and can introduce latency. Uh, more probably, we or you will be on the side of writing a user space application which is processing uh, some input and again we need to pay special attention to make it actually real time. Uh, for example, it is very important to do proper initialization and to do all initialization at the start of the process, which uh, has the advantage that this initialization doesn't have to be real time itself. So when we first power up the device and launch this application, uh, we don't care if it's real time usually right away. We can allow for a brief period to go through. Uh, what you should do, you should pre-allocate, lock, and pre-fault all the memory this application will require. Because, for example, calling malloc to allocate memory, uh, if you have done it, you didn't think how long it takes, and usually it's quite fast. The operating system returns memory uh, if it has available quickly. But if the system is running for a long time, the free memory can get fragmented, and if you require a, a big chunk of memory, the operating system suddenly will take a lot of time shuffling memory around to make space for the big chunk you requested. And this will kill your latency. So in real-time uh, application, you request all the memory up front. But this is not enough. You have to lock it, saying, this memory, I want it for myself. I'm not giving it up. And you have to pre-fault it, meaning you have to access the memory at least once because those of you who are familiar with how uh, the virtual memory system works would know that when you request a memory, you get some virtual address, but there is no physical memory behind it bound yet. When you do the first access, it will cause a page fault, and then the memory management unit will fill in some table which will say this virtual address is mapped to this physical address. And this operation takes time. So if you don't access your memory at least one, you will be in for a surprise when you try to access some memory during your very critical section which needs to happen in microseconds and suddenly generates a page fault and you have a big uh, delay. Uh, you should, of course, configure and create all the threads. You should configure the scheduling uh, parameters and the CPU affinity and isolation that uh, Bogdan talked about. But even if we do everything perfectly and there is no bug in the Linux kernel and the real-time patches, unfortunately, the real world has more surprises for us. And this surprise is called hardware. All the software runs on some piece of hardware. And uh, hardware was, again, not designed for real-time, with real-time in mind. It was optimized for the throughput, uh, high throughput case. Uh, there are such things called non-maskable interrupts and low-level firmware inside the UEFI or, or before BIOS of your motherboard, which can actually stop the CPU and start running some code which is beyond the control of the operating system at all. And uh, unfortunately, we know nothing about that. Usually, it's a secret of the motherboard manufacturer what we can do is we can run some software, uh, we'll have some uh, hopefully useful links on the next slide, which can measure this and detect if our current piece of hardware has such uh, secret functions. Uh, also, what uh, is not friendly for real time, it's low power. We have to give up these two. All kind of power saving functions like lowering the CPU frequency, uh, or putting the CPU into idle states causes delays because changing this state from one to the other takes time and we don't want to have to do this. Uh, again, another thing, optimizing high throughput, the so-called hyper-threading. Uh, it turned out that actually 
the CPU core, the, the arithmetic and logical unit, uh, is not easily kept busy 100% of the time. Uh, the infrastructure around it, the structure decoders, the fetchers, and so on, are rather slow. So Intel came up with the idea. We have one, actually, a CPU core, but we'll show you two virtual ones. Uh, so we can keep the one core busy by presenting the two virtual ones. But this, again, uh, is bad for real time because a process running on the virtual uh, side link of your core can influence uh, your process. So it's best recommended to disable hyper-trading and give up some throughput again for low latency. And another case I have mentioned here, just for completeness, in some system, uh, it's called non-uniform memory architecture. If there are multiple memory banks and multiple CPUs, some CPUs will have fast access to some memory banks and slower access to the other and the other CPU will have fast access to the banks close to it and lower to the other. So if you don't take this into account where you allocate the memory and on which CPU is pinned uh, your process, you can get additional delays if it's trying to access the memory, uh, which lives uh, further away from this uh, CPU. Uh, so I guess the moral of the story is that uh, real time is not easy uh, to get right. Uh, and I will just give some examples because we don't uh, usually think about it, uh, what is real time. For example, imagine I, how many of you have a 3D printer at home? Okay, I expected more, but still, there is some people. If we control this 3D printer with Linux, uh, and there is, uh, usually these printers have switches to limit the positions so the carriage doesn't jump into one side, uh, and this if it's controlled by a Linux system, we should hopefully be using a real-time enabled one. Because when the carriage goes to one way, touches this switch, it generates a signal that the carriage has reached the end of its travel. And this signal generates an interrupt, and we want this interrupt handled immediately, not after 20 milliseconds, when maybe the current through the motor caused it to, to burn or to break the mechanical parts uh, of our system. Uh, and another aspect is that even if we don't have such examples of external inputs, even if we want to generate precise events within our system, uh, we need real-time capability. For example, if somebody of you has played with microcontrollers uh, or the Raspberry Pi kind of things, with the Raspberry Pi and Linux, it's not easy to generate precise uh, timing of some signals on a GPIO pin. Again, because you don't know how the scheduler reacts if it's a non-real-time system. And uh, if you want to generate fast, exactly time signals, you would need uh, real-time enabled uh, Linux uh, kernel. Uh, and these are some links about tools. And uh, actually, I recommend this uh, very much. There is a company called Bootlin, which organizes uh, trainings, but all their training materials are freely available. And they have a very good uh, set of training materials and exercises for, for preempt RT support in Linux. Uh, the other is uh, a tool which measures the system latency. Actually, the graphs we saw in the, one of the first slides showing the latency spreads they were generated with the cyclic test tool, which is kind of the main one for, for verifying real-time capability of our system. And there is one called hardware latency detector, which tries to see these hidden uh, features of your hardware which can cause latencies. And one for measuring power usage and the tracing system in the Linux kernel because sometimes you will get the unexpected latency. And if you want to trace which part of the kernel exactly caused this delay, you have to dig in, uh, dig in deeper. Uh, and we have a little bit of time for questions, so I hope we have some. Unless, Bogdan, you have something to add. No, nothing to add. Please, your questions, if there are any. Okay, first, a round of applause, and I see a question there. Ако използвате някаква общо взето Core Boot или Libre Boot вместо UFI, това би ли помогнало за този проблем, с който се наблюдаваше? 
Uh, so the question was, if we use an open source uh, firmware, would it help uh, with some of the problem? I, I would say yes. Uh, I'm not that familiar uh, with all the details, especially of Intel architecture. I know there is even stuff uh, like for remote management and things that can control the CPU, but it's definitely a step in the right direction because there is no secret source. We know what this firmware is doing. So it's a good uh, suggestion. Uh, just a question about the, because you uh, talked quite a lot about uh, synchronization and locks, uh, do you have any kind of experience or can say anything about lock-free synchronization? Like, Sorry, about? Like CAS compare and swap synchronization, like for example, lock-free synchronization in this context or? Mm, I would say if you can get away without locks, it's always better. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, the, the problem with locks in real time, it's that the, the spinning locks prevent, in the normal kernel, prevent preemption. So what you want to avoid, uh, this is uh, also possible uh, even wi with the real-time patches. Uh, for example, it's called priority inversion. Uh, imagine you have a shared resource and the low priority process holds the lock to this yeah. uh, resource. And suddenly, the higher priority process wants to run. But unfortunately, it also needs this resource. So it has to wait for, for the slow process to finish, release the lock, and then the high priority one will start. And this is uh, solved. There are few types of locks which support so-called priority inheritance. And in such a case, the low priority process holding the locks, its priority will be increased to the one of the high priority process waiting for it, so it will kind of speed up uh, the time that the lock is freed. Okay. So this is, uh, if you use locks, another aspect. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, over here. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, I have a question regarding the, you mentioned that you started the, the, whole, the whole journey deciding that you go with RT Linux for a specific task. Uh, what made you choose RT Linux? I Meaning, did you, did you have specific requirements? How many, let's say, real-time uh, inputs you have to pro pro process? What, what type of hardware? Can you just share more details about the design of the, of the system? Let's say, uh, how many cores did you decide to put processing the real-time tasks? What did you allocate for, let's say, non-real-time processing? And uh, it's a bit, I would say, uh, Bogdan, you can uh, also say your opinion, but I, I would say it's uh, you don't get it right the, right the first time. It's an iterative process trying to adjust all the process priorities to work together on the hardware you have. Uh, and sometimes what we didn't mention is a possible problem if you have a, a if you put high priority to your process and it takes up all the cores, you can starve the Linux kernel and all the other processes. So if the high priority process always wants to run, the other can be uh, practically stopped. And actually there is support in the Linux kernel for such situation which would kind of, you would say, we reserve 10% for the Linux kernel uh, housekeeping tasks and such things. Uh, why I would think that the answer was that you have a whole Unix-like operating system which makes life much easier. Uh, otherwise, what I have seen and still see, and it's still a very valid uh, design pattern, it's to have one system, ARM, i86, whatever, running Linux, but not really concerned with hard real-time tasks. And on the side, as periphery, have a couple of small microcontrollers which handle the really, uh, really uh, requirements for the, for the small timings, and the two systems communicate via I squared C or a serial connection. So that's also a valid design. But then you you have to deal with more CPUs, different compilers, and uh... yeah, just one thing to add that uh, always when you are working on the RT application, uh, your goal, what you want to do, is to find the worst case scenario where the latency is uh, uh, is absolutely maximum, and. Unfortunately, as far as I understand, as far as I know, there is no 
mathematical way to calculate this path. There is only empirical testing that you can run against your application to see if it works or not. Yeah. And we have time for one last question. It's over here. So, as you might probably guess, how do you deal with complex instruction set processors? Because uh, small microcontrollers that run free RTOS and things like that use uh, risk architectures, and their instructions are usually defined how much time they take. But if you have a x86 processor with AVX instructions and you code, code two vector operations, they run in some undefined amount of time. How do you deal with that? Uh, I wouldn't say we go that uh, low level. It's true that for a simple microcontroller, knowing each instruction takes a certain amount of cycles, you can make the very precise, predictable uh, calculation how long this operation will, will take. Uh, but uh, in, in our case, dealing with Intel, uh, it's, as Bogdan said, uh, you use these measurement tools to see what are, what are the latencies. And uh, you cannot uh, change the microcode or, or examine it. I, I haven't gone at least that deep. OK, so no x86-based uh, cars? No, example. actually, <laughs> there are x86-based cars on the road now. Right. But it's, it's uh, as Bogdan said, you care about the worst case latency. Because even in my graphs in the first uh, page, you could see that the non-real-time kernel had latencies close to zero. But it was just you got lucky this time. But you cannot rely that you will get lucky. In fact, you want to find out what is the worst possible time that it will take. And you put this boundary. And if it is OK for your system, it's good. So even with Intel processor, when you, what the, the strategy is, you put maximum load on the system. You run the measurements. And you see the maximal reaction times. And even if the instruction can take different amount of cycles, if it's within your time budget, it's OK. OK, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we kind of run out of time 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so I know that there are some other questions. Our speakers uh, will be around here. So if you talk to Bogdan and Rado, please do it in the hall. Yes, home. we'll be in the, in the SUSE booth outside. And I just want to tell you that you will never get your software right the first time or the second time. Uh, and you will need a way to update your software in an embedded system. And just after this lecture is finished, our helpful host, Leon, will present how can we update <laughs> the <laughs> software in embedded systems. <laughs> Thank you, thank you guys. We'll be outside if you want to chat more.